to another episode of Disrupting the Dominoes. I'm Marlene Limas, the CEO of Pay Prevention, Proactive Anti-Violence Education. And when we say disrupting the dominoes, we are disrupting the dominoes of violence, those dominoes that continue to fall. And when we were discussing violence, it's the full spectrum, microaggression through full-blown physical event. Um, we, I'm incredibly excited about our next guest. Um, I think you guys are really going to enjoy the conversations that we're having and the path that our guest has taken um, to get to where he's at today. And um, we're super excited to have him. Now, I'm just going to go through a few of his accomplishments and a few of his endeavors. Um, and um, we'll, we'll get started in chatting with him. So our guest is the co-founder and the chief operating officer of the Hudson House. Uh, he is a board member of Responsible Hospitality, uh, the Hos Responsible Hospitality Institute. He is a managing member of Helios Hospitality Group. He is a founding trustee, and these are the next two organizations that I really find uh, intriguing. The founding trustee of the New York City Hospitality Alliance and the former president of the New York Nightlife Association. So an incredible career, and he's doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. So please, please uh, welcome our next guest, Paul Sears. As always, on the move, Paul, on the move. Welcome. Thank you, Arlene. Good to be here. So, I mean, what an incredible, uh, what an incredible journey you've been on, an exciting journey. So before we get to kind of the meat of violence prevention in our discussion, I just would like to know, and I'm sure our viewers and listeners would like to know, how does a mu music major from New York University <laughs> turn into a hospitality guru, a nightlife legend, where CeeLo, where he's hanging out with CeeLo and Black Eyed Peas, uh, to an advocate for safer workplaces and safer communities in addition to everything you do. How does that happen? So I, when I went to NYU, I actually graduated with two Bachelor of Fine Arts. And whenever I say that, I, I always say that that kind of guaranteed me a place in the hospitality industry because, you know, graduating with two Bachelor of Fine Arts, it's not like I'm going to recruiters, I'm going to agents and, and things like that. And so, you know, hospitality, in my opinion, has always been that amazing industry that has given people the ability to go out and um, learn their crafts, learn the things that they want to do, yet still be able to pay the rent. And that's one of the reasons why I think hospitality was such a great fit for me. Um, and so I've kind of always been an entrepreneur my, my entire life, ever since uh, really 16. I just have always worked for myself. You know, I used to work in restaurants and bars for other people. But then when I got out on my own, I really just kind of started working for myself. And um, I think it was because of that uh, perspective where I just kind of wanted to get into uh, something uh, on a regular basis. Now, in the beginning, I was able to balance out a little bit of both. I ended up becoming a commercial director for about 10 years where I would do a lot of short format things like that. And so uh, while I was building my resume, uh, working in the nightlife industry was a perfect opportunity because I could, I could, you know, work on production shoots during the day and then, you know, work for rent at night. And that's kind of how I saw uh, myself fitting into the industry. And then opportunities started arising in the industry that I was using as a, a vehicle to pay my bills. And it just kind of worked out that way that I started getting more and more into those types of opportunities. You know, Paul, I heard you say something in an interview um, and you said something to the extent of you really feel um, like it's bigger than just offering a service to your community, running a good restaurant or running a good nightclub. It was more than that for you. It really was creating, uh, I, I'm, the word fun, is safe from, environment. fun, safe environments is the words that I yeah, I mean, but you felt like it really was a community service and you've really been driven by that kind of ideal of making your community better, healthier, happier. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, I've always thought of like food as love, you know, if you're cooking a good meal for someone and then you mm -hmm. couple that with a great atmosphere um, where you where it's welcoming and safe. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it really is a refuge. It really is a, 
an hour and a half out of your day that's, you know, special. So I, I hadn't thought about it like that until I heard your presentation. So I've always thought, you know, when I look back at my, my career and I look back at all of those, you know, patrons that have gone through my doors, how many have met their loved ones, met their forever partner? How many, um, you know, maybe it was just a one night stand, but they ended up having a child together and that enhanced their lives together. Uh, how many weddings and special events that have happened at my venues. You know, I always say as an operator, uh, you know, our job is to create these fun, safe environments. And so when you go out to a restaurant, when you go to a bar to meet friends or, you know, uh, any sort of other social um, activity that involves um, patronizing um, establishments or venues, nightlife, um, uh, festival, anything, um, you know, I think it, it's as an operator, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that our patrons, when they're there, they can escape for that hour and a half, like you said, Arlene, or two hours or three hours or whatever it is that they could actually escape from um, these ideas or whatever they're doing in their private life. And so I think it's twofold, right? I think it's what's happening in the moment and being able to provide for that. And then also it's that idea of, well, if your venue and if you do provide a fun, safe environment, you are going to be responsible for those wonderful memories that people have. And, you know, I do, I'm always, I've always been a community, a sense of community type of person. Um, when I felt the nightlife industry was kind of being under attack. And then um, one of my venues personally was caught up in this, this whole wave of um, uh, nuisance abatement acts that we had going on in the city around nightlife, uh, which was temporary closures around, you know, silly, silly stuff. Um, I got mad and I wanted a voice. And so my uh, liquor license attorney at the time, Robert Bookman, uh, basically said, look, you should join the Nightlife Association and come on the board and, and you know, hear what we're doing because we're going out and fighting all of these things. Um, and so that's how my activism in the industry really started. Um, and it's because of that sense of community that I felt like, well, you know, we need a bigger voice. And so, um, you know, from there, it, it kind of snowballed into, um, well, let me take a quick step back, if I may. Um, in 2005, New York City nightlife had three really, really bad tragedies that put a stain on the industry and put a stain on the city, really. It was three murders that were senseless, and they all happened right around nightlife. Uh, one was an underage girl um, who uh, they had parked their car illegally, and she got scared and ended up getting picked up by her, her would-be killer. Uh, one was a bouncer who shot a girl who ended up staying at a bar after her friends had left. Uh, he had he had ended up raping uh, this girl and dumping her in a field for dead. Uh, and then the third was a bouncer who went to his car and um, got a sidearm and shot two guests after an argument at the end of a night. Anyway, all three of these things happened within about a seven to eight month period. And so um, at the time, Christine Quinn, who was the speaker of the city council and a friend of the industry, basically said to us, hey, we're going to hold a summit. Let's talk about what, what are the things that can come out of it. And so what came out of this was this working group uh, with NYPD where we developed the best practices guidelines that is now going on its fourth generate, uh, fourth edition. Um, and these pra best practices got, and it was a chance for, for the first time ever in New York City uh, history where NYPD met with an industry like Nightlight and got together and said, okay, why aren't you guys calling us when there are problems? Well, every time we call you, we get a story. Why would, uh, summons. Why would I want to call? Why am I incentivized to call the police if every time I have to call the police, I have to defend myself in a court of law later down the road? And so those were the barriers that we broke down. And it took us a good year and a half on that first edition to break down those barriers. And that was really my first, you know, healthy meal of that activism and what I was doing for the industry. Because anything that came out of that book, if you followed those guidelines and you were a, 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 a nightlife venue um, and you followed those guidelines, you were, um, you were good. You were, you, you, you were good with the police. Now it's not to say if there was nothing, if there, if there was illicit activity going on at your premise that you knew about, you wouldn't be, you know, implicated, but that is to say that in the instance of whatever's going on, if you follow those guidelines, the police are going to basically say, thank you for working with us. And right. so that was like one of the first things. And then, and then from there, it just kind of snowballed where 
the best practices guideline got out. And that's when um, Lisa Friel, who at the time was chief of sex crimes for Manhattan under Morgenthau, um, each of the sex crimes, um, uh, each of the sex crime units in uh, the five boroughs of New York City and the five counties of New York City, um, all have a sexual assault task force. And on the sexual assault task force is um, uh, NYPD for SVU, their special victims unit, um, the uh, victim advocacy groups for the hospitals and things like that, the hospitals, the DAs that are trying, it, it's almost like an inverse look at law and order around um, SVU because you're working with the, the attorneys as well that are trying the cases. And most of the talk is really all about preservation of evidence, rape kits, things like that. You know, the, yep. the, the technical aspects of what happens um, when one of these horrific crimes occur. Um, and she contacted the Nightlife Association. I didn't even know they had this committee. And she said, um, you know, we've got a problem. And uh, we said, well, what's the problem? She says, well, you know, a lot of sexual assaults are happening, not on the premises within New York City, but they're meeting and then going other places where the sexual assaults are, are, are happening. And whether um, uh, there's drugging involved or, or any of, of these things, what she was saying was, it's really not on the venues, but what we're trying to do is figure out a way to get ahead of this. Right. And so I, I sat in on one of their meetings and she, she asked me point blank. She goes, what do you guys, what, what do you need? I said, training. I said, you right. got to understand something. We, we, you know, part of our business in nightlife is selling a sexual appeal, whether you're LGBTQ plus or whether you're in the hetero community, it doesn't matter. Nightlife is all about, you know, kind of sexual appeal and that, 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 that kind of freedom of um, inhibition, if you will, a little bit to, to some people. And um, I said, we don't, you know, you know, look, we know that, uh, you know, if you grab somebody's, uh, if you grab somebody who doesn't want to be grabbed, that's obviously the big thing, but You've got you've got couples that are paying uh, bus boys, you know, fifty and seventy five dollars to stay away from them so they can be private. So <laughs> you, there there was all of this other stuff, kind of confusion going on. And she said, "Okay, how can we do this?" And I said, "Well, we need training, so we got to figure out a best way to kind of come up with this training." And so she asked me to join the task force, and I did. And out of this group, we kind of came up with um, focus groups that went into the sexual assault training that we later developed, the curriculum that we later developed for nightlife. And so I know that was kind of like a very convoluted way to get from your quote that you had of mine of, you know, what the types of venues that we have and, and you know, what our jobs are as, as owner and operators, kind of going through the activism portion of, of my career and how I got to the sexual violence um, portion. No, I, no I, I think that's incredible. And I, I will bring up some more questions around the 2014 alliance that you made. Um, with the DA, the Manhattan DA, but I do want to back up on something you said because it just struck me like whack, a smack in the face. So you don't, initially, there's issues. You don't want to call the police because you're going to be asked to ask answer 10,000 questions and then maybe made to be brought up on some charges that may not even be seen or um, your license be in peril or something like this. And I just saw just quickly the correlation between someone coming forward at work in the workplace about something that's happening or someone that's coming forward about an assault or a rape. That's kind of that same experience that happens unfortunately a lot where the questionings don't, it doesn't turn into what they came for, right? They came to share information about something inappropriate that's happening. You went forward to police, you wanted to go forward to police to discuss inappropriate things that were happening. And instead of them addressing the inappropriate things that were happening, they decided to ask you, hey, can I take a look in your back room and see uh, what this is and what that, do you have the proper easement in your back door and so on. The, that's just amazing that so, parallel. So here's, here's where it gets a little bit even more specific. So. If I, let's say for the sake of argument, had a fight and I called 911 prior to this working group coming together and creating these best practices, automatically, once the police arrive, they're not leaving without giving me a disorderly premise. That's automatic. That was, that was NYPD policy. So automatically, I'm incentivized not to report any wrongdoing, even though I have a desire to, because not only will that 
disorderly premise summons um, make me go and um, have my attorney, which I have to pay, go and fight it. But it also goes against my liquor license, like you had mentioned. Ah, there and 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 that's where and that's what I can't have happen because that's obviously my bread and butter. And so that that's why we were disincentivized. And so when we sat down to this first meeting, I'll never forget this. The chief of the civil uh, of uh, the civil enforcement unit, guy by the name of Robert Mester, he was actually a civilian. I really like Rob a lot. Good guy. Um, he said, "Why don't you guys call us?" And when we told him this is what was happening. NYPD had done something that it, I've never seen happen in one week. In one week, they said, if a venue calls for help through the 911 communication, you, the, the, only, the only person eligible to write a disorderly premise must be the precinct CO or the commanding officer of the precinct at that time. So if it's the XO, it's the XO. If it's the CO, it's the CO. That took it away from that sergeant that now is writing that summons when they show up. It's going to a much higher place where they can assess it and say, hey, these guys did the right thing. They called us. Why would I give them a summons? And that's, that's how we knew the relationship had changed. That's when we knew that the enforcement part of our city really was trying to work with us and move the, and move, um, the middle ground closer together so that we could theoretically you know, come together and figure out better ways to work. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how this whole thing you know, really started was, how do we gain trust with each other's bot and with each other's? Now we're on the fourth edition, there's nothing but trust. We're probably on our fourth or fifth different working group. Um, and it's just been an amazing experience working with them. And, it's a, and our best practices have been um, copied all throughout. But the, parallel, um, the parallels that you had mentioned, Arlene, um, it's interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think about it like that. But um, that 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 um, that desire to kind of keep something away if 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 you're only going to get retributed against or something to that effect. And I think that's kind of where we went with the curriculum as well around sexual violence is that we wanted it to be for managers and owners too, because if people are going to be coming to you for these these complaints or if you are yourself involved in them, this is what's going to happen. And I think that's that's a really important part of it because it can't just be, you know, the bartenders and the servers or the patrons. It really has to be the people, you know, the managers and, uh, you know, the owners. There was, a, um, there was an article yesterday. I just saw Sweet and Vicious, which is a bar that's been in New York City for a while now, just had to settle half a million dollars on six sexual, uh, sexual assault um, lawsuits uh, that Letitia James, our, the New York State District, uh, New York uh, State Attorney General got involved um, because it was so flagrant. Now this is a bar that's been probably trendy and been and I didn't you know no one knew that I didn't know that it was going on and it's horrific that it still goes on that even within that kind of a workplace you know people feel um, subjugated to 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 that unwanted behavior. Yeah, I mean the framework that you've created there in New York, and this is why what excites me about Pave being connected to people like you, Paul, and having you as a resource and having you as a speaker, which we'll discuss later at our summit, that you've already put together a framework of collaboration, everybody getting to the table and acknowledging the problem. Okay, now, well, now what? Now what? And then really trying to put this best practices into place and then sharing it. I mean, you've been to Toronto speaking about it. You've been all over the country speaking about it. Um, it's just very exciting, this template, I'll say, that you've, that you've given to us. I mean, it's an incredible track that you followed, and I'm very appreciative uh, of the experience that you're sharing with us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm going to no, back wonderful. you up even a little more, because a way okay. that, one of the other ways that, I, from what I've read about you and heard about you and uh, researched about you. One of the main things that got your, got everybody to raise their eyebrow when you started talking was you created or were one of the um, initiators for this financial impact study on what your sector, how it impacted New York. And this is a little bit PAVE's approach as well because we want to show sectors and workplaces, how much they're being impacted by not reducing violence in their sector and in their workplace. So share with us what waves presenting that financial impact statement 
created? So back, so we created the first nightlife and economic impact study about around that industry in New York City. And the reason that we kind of did that was because no elected official in New York City would give us the time of day. They didn't understand how many people we employed, how much we paid in taxes, how many unique visitors we get, and how much our industry was part of the fabric of tourism. There are 9 million residents in New York City. There are, I think I want to say, 12,000 licensed establishment in the five boroughs. It's not for, that's not for 12, you know, 9 million residents. That's for 60 million unique visitors we get a year, or we did. We're starting to get back with that. And um, we, we, we didn't have a voice and we were trying to be heard. And so we figured one of two things. One, show the economic impact that our industry has for the city. And two, show them what we could do on a political spectrum. How can we rally the troops and create voters for certain electeds? And that's when electeds really started paying attention to us. Um, now, what the economic impact study really did for us, at least back in 2004, is it started opening up all of these doors that weren't being able to open before because people mm -hmm. saw the data and they were willing to listen. Now, it's an, it, it's an impact study. It's an economic impact study. So, of course, it's, it's market research. You can kind of skew it however you want to skew it. But when you look at the actual facts, you know, if you take an average person or an average couple who's in the tri-state area that might want to come into the city for a night, they'll get a hotel room. Maybe she gets her hair done. Maybe he buys a new outfit. May, then they go out to eat for dinner. Then they take a cab to the nightclub. Then they go to the nightclub. Then they take another cab back to the hotel. I mean, it just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up. And once you finally see what the numbers are, you know, we're, we're a force to be reckoned with. One of, the, one of the key things that I think opened up everybody's eyes was that we have more entries in all of our venues and all of our licensed establishments in New York City than all of our sport, major sports teams combined. Now think about that. That's the New York Giants, the New York Jets, the New York Rangers, the New York Islanders, the New Jersey Devils, the New York Knicks, the Brooklyn Nets, the New York Yankees, and the New York Mets. That we have more than that. We have more entries than all of Broadway to combine. And when you start thinking about the numbers in that aspect, what you're really getting at is an industry that is really all about um, uh, putting back into the city. And so that economic impact study, like I said, just opened up all of these doors. And then later, you know, you know, like everything kind of good, it got copied and, and other cities and other markets started seeing um, uh, the, re, the, the importance of something like that and, and what it could also offer them. Yeah, this is, again, another template, you know, um, that we're thinking of is in line with the way you have set up your journey. Uh, and that is that, you know, the summit is really important to us. And when we come out of that summit, we're hoping to produce the PAVE report, which has data, has statistics, has intersectionality of all the sectors that we've invited to have the discussion around workplace violence, healthcare sector, hospitality sector, aviation, sporting, emergency preparedness. And then we're hoping that, you know, that has some meat and people start listening to us and people start taking another look. So, you know, we're, we're very excited about the example that efforts like your presentation of this impact study has done. Let me give you another quick example, Arlene, of how, how you know, uh, current events will, will spark new things. Um, after Orlando, um, uh, Pace Night, I think it's called the Pace Nightclub. Was it the Pace Nightclub? Yep. The Orlando, uh, the, the Orlando nightclub that had the shooting, uh, the, the mass shooting. After Orlando, everybody got scared, obviously. Um, and, you know, we've always said that we're one, we're one backpack filled with explosives away from just, you know, having the industry be decimated again. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do take, you know, we, we, we are very careful. But after that, we went to NYPD and we said, we need active shooter training. We, 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 we don't know what to do in those instances. And so the only thing that NYPD had at that time was an active shooter training for an office. And so you're in a room with 25 or 30 different venues, with their security, with their managers, some owners, and you're talking about filing cabinets? Like, how do I hide behind a filing cabinet? And what filing cabinet can stop which round of ammunition and things like, I mean, I'm, I, where am I going to office and we're gonna lift up the filing cabinets, bring them to the dance floor so everybody can, I, it didn't make sense. And so what came out of that was, 
NYPD, Crime Prevention, and their SHIELDS program, which is their uh, anti-terrorism uh, anti group, got together and they created a video on active shooter training for nightlife establishments. Just, just ideas that we could kind of come up with. So again, it's, you know, mother is the, you know, necessity is the mother of invention here, where there's a need, we have a voice, we'll use it. And that's, that's where we're at. Yeah. And, and that's it. You know, that's exactly, I feel the strength of PAVE and their programming mm -hmm. is the, our ability to personalize these training sessions uh, and these training modules to personalize them with scenarios. It's trauma informed. Um, those are the type of strengths that we bring uh, even to a topic like act active shooter situation. And I was going mm -hmm. to bring that up because you know, Paul, there are just so many incredible collaborations that you have had. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm. people have acknowledged that this is one of your superpowers, because it seems to me from the outside looking in that you have this superpower to just bring people together to facilitate change and, or, or create an experience that's incredible, even at your, at your, um, restaurants and your hotels and your your nightclubs it just seems like you're so willing to collaborate and bring in new and fresh ideas or partners that may not right off the beginning look like a good fit but i mean i hope you see that and i'm sure you oh, no, no, no. I'm, you I, 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 believe hope, I hope you see it I, I don't know if it's a superpower but i do believe in the art of collaboration and i think you get I, one of the greatest problems that I think, especially our, our country uh, is having right now is a lack of understanding of perspective. I, and I was, I, I'm guilty of it too. Like for the longest time, I could not talk to a millennial. I couldn't, I, I, I just, the conversation never went anywhere for me. And so it, <laughs> you'll laugh, but it got to a point where I literally, um, if I spoke to somebody at one of my venues and they just went off on, like, I'll give you an example real quick. Uh, I was standing behind my bar one night and it was packed and there was a guy just waving a 20 and he was drunk and you know, it's three deep at the bar and my bartenders are doing their hustling as much as possible. I'm like my man, just calm down. She'll get to you in a second. Just relax. Yeah. But I, I need a drink. I know. I know. Just waving the money's not going to get it fast. And, and this report just kept kind of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I was like, dude, you're going the wrong way here i'm trying to get you to understand get them to understand and so got to the point where my head of security would see me talking to somebody and then you know bang that person gets you know thrown out once they get a little heated or whatever and so i sat down with somebody uh who was a millennial we actually had a really honest conversation about it and i said i honestly don't know how to communicate because i feel like whether it's impatience from this um uh, you know, this, this, this instant gratification that you kind of all grew up in, or whether it's entitlement, I don't know, I have a hard time. And he gave me his perspective. And that just blew my mind. It just opened me up. Because at that point, I was like, you've got to understand perspective. And so all my life has been understanding that I'm not the only one that's if I present an idea, that's great. If somebody can come to that and add something to from their perspective that makes it that much better fantastic i mean that's even better and so collaboration is is really important yeah i mean i i agree with you as a coach i always expose my athletes to other coaches other even other sports sure. to make them better at to better to make them better at taekwondo and there yeah. were so many coaches out there that would never let their athletes get in front of another coach in fear that they'd lose them or in fear that it would make them look less or, uh, I, I mean, it just amazed me uh, when that was the approach. Uh, I mean, yeah. to me, collaboration is everything. And as a coach, I want my athletes to be better than me, not as good as me, to be better right. than me. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure for you, I mean, you want every project to be better than the next. Uh, I want my staff to, to be better than me. I want I yeah. want my staff to be better than me. I want my employees to be better than me. I want them to come to me and say, hey, I found this. What do you think? You know, I want them to come to me with their ideas and say, this is what I'm thinking here. Because without that, um, I, it can't... I, I mean, there are very few projects that I've ever done where it's only just about me. And I just don't, I don't, it's, that's not, it's not who I am. It's never yeah. been who I am. So it's very clear that you enjoy the collaboration. Probably if you had yeah. to do it on your own, it wouldn't be as much fun. Sure. I mean, there, there, I, I, there are meetings where all I'm doing is going from, you know, 
contractor, to designer, to, to marketing, to whatever. And we're all talking about the same goals, which is how do we make this a success? And it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. So I also heard you through a, an interview, you spoke about um, what post-pandemic industry looks like, what your sector looks post-pandemic. And you made a statement that, you know, my gut tells me it's going to be something like the Roaring Twenties. And we feel at PAVE, we feel very similar to that. We feel that there's no going back anymore. Everybody is looking for new approaches, innovative approaches, not the same old way of doing things. And they're not going to settle for the same old way of doing things. And uh, we feel that positions PAVE in a very good way, in a very good place, because we do bring a whole new approach to violence prevention. But if you'd like to share a little bit more about what that vision is and what you think the Roaring Twenties in 2023 looks like. Well, you're starting to see it in some of the major cities that are opening up again, right? You know, especially the ones that don't have to deal with another strain of COVID or monkeypox or whatever else we've got going on in our society right now. Um, what you're seeing is a lot of people that have saved up or had saved up money over in 2020 um, uh, and even parts of 2021 now going out and just kind of having a, you know, live for today uh, attitude. Um, so I think that's going to continue. Um, I think you're starting to see um, it's it slow down a little bit, um, but you are seeing more and more um, hospitality uh, places open. And I would guess within the six months, you'll probably see about 75, 75% of those fail because I think a lot of people are just getting in on a good opportunity and may not necessarily know how to operate once they, once they open. Uh, I think there's a lot of that that kind of goes on. So I do think that what's going to happen, especially because of what we're coming out of with COVID, um, is going to be a uh, more vibrant um, social economy um, for um, um, most places and, and most municipalities. I like to use the, the, so the, the term social economy really comes from my work with RHI, Responsible Hospitality Institute. And it's a way that you can kind of encompass all of the different factors around hospitality. You can't say nightlife anymore because now we have daylight, you know, which is perfect for people my age where you go to those brunches and you can still be home by seven or eight o'clock at night. You don't have to go all night. So nightlife, daylife, restaurants, bars, um, festivals, open spaces, those to me all present the social economy. And most of that, if not all of that, is centered around some form of food and beverage, right? You always wanna have that because that's, that's really, like you said, it's love. It's, it's how people kind of come together. And I think that, you know, that when, when we're talking about the vibrancy of social economies, um, what I'm seeing across the country is smaller municipalities who understand the importance of a vibrant social economy or even a nighttime economy, you know, the other 95, but then how do you handle uh, quality of life issues for the residences in the nearby neighborhoods? How do you handle sexual violence? How do you handle uh, crime, street crime? How do, you how do you manage those things if you're a municipality and work with the city? You know, we always used to say, you know, if you plan, then manage, you don't need police, right? You don't need the, the enforcement part of it if you plan and manage. If you just do the police, there's no point in managing or planning because now you're listening to a different authority. So, you know, the, it's, and, it's that And it's I, would that say that, I would say, Paul, that that's reactionary. Thousand percent. Yeah, 1000% because they see the crime, they go in and they fix the crime. If a premise is having multiple uh, uh, similar crimes recurring, they'll take that into account as they may pursue action against the venue. Uh, venue. So again, it's really you know getting those municipalities to come to the table and sit down with their police force, sit down with the venue operators and say, hey guys, look, this is what's happening in our district. Now, New York City is unique. It doesn't have any one entertainment district, most major cities like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, the big ones, Miami, these are all spread out throughout the city. But when you get into places like Savannah, Georgia, or even some smaller secondary, even tertiary markets, they're going to have these nightlife districts. And within these nightlife districts, you'll have all of these kind of problems come up. And then how do you address them? How do you bring that back? And then, and, and then that, of course, just goes back to collaboration. So I think the Roaring Twenties are, I think we're going to continue this expansion of, uh, of, of the industry in terms of getting it back to um, a pre-COVID number. Um, 
you're going to see some, you're going to see some carnage from it. You'll see some fallout. You'll see some venues that don't make it, but in the end, I think you're going to, what's going to come out is a lot of really good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And you know, when it comes to violence prevention, I think we are at a point, especially as the pandemic presented higher levels of domestic violence, higher levels of toxicity, as your industry has seen, um, incivility, all those things. Um, I think that as we go back, we're not going to settle for that. We're going to want real substantial change. Um, yeah, I agree. So I'm, I'm going to jump now to our summit, and that is the PAVE Summit uh, that we're hosting in Chicago uh, in mm -hmm. September. And you are one of our premier speakers, and we're very fortunate to have you as our listeners and our viewers can see the value that you bring uh, from our from our podcast today. Um, you know what are what are, what do you think? What are your goals or expectations for the summit? And and I mean, I'm hoping you say oh, real substantial. We come up with something meaty. But you know what what how are you feeling about the summit and 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 your contribution there? Well, I think, you know, especially when, because I, I don't know the other panels, right? I only know hospitality right now, but I know who's on hospitality. And um, two, two, two of the other people that are on the panels are, are you know, Nick Matone, I've known for years, and he's a wonderful friend and uh, a great person that, that we, I've had this wonderful relationship with throughout the years. And then Carolyn Richmond, who I've also known for many, many years, um, uh, you know, the high, so we before we were the hospitality alliance we were part of the new york state restaurant association and carolyn was on our on our board there then as well and so i've known carolyn for years and and fox rothschild has always been a fighter um around the labor issues that our industry has so um fantastic panel i think what i'm really hoping to get out of it is this this again this goes back to it kind of all funnels back to collaboration is what other perspectives people are bringing and, 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 and how that relates to, uh, or how that could relate to um, harm reduction or preventive training and things like that. Um, because you're gonna get this wide breadth from these different perspectives in terms of you know, uh, how people have handled certain things at different points in their careers and things like that. So I think that's really the primary thing that I'm kind of looking at. I'm always looking to meet people and you know, just share ideas. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. Great. So I ask every guest, we're, we're coming to the end. Uh, so I have one follow up. Uh, but before I ask my, my last question that I ask all our guests, um, I just want to give you a moment to share. If there's anything you'd like to share with our listeners or our viewers about what you've got going on now. I'm hoping uh, that you share a little information. You might have something fresher now. I know that the, the monastery distillery has been open for a, a little a while year, now. Almost please, a year. please share yeah. information on that because that looks like a fantastic venue and facility. Um, I'll have to find my way there at some point. But if there's anything yes. new that you're working on, please share it. So, um, uh, yeah, well, it's funny. Um, I, I, I say that the, the distillery is really like my midlife. This is my red Porsche moment. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a crisis, but um, I was looking to do a change. I found that nightlife in New York City was really becoming um, an industry of parody. And I just you couldn't have been, you, there was, there was, it was very difficult to be as creative as you needed to be to, to, to enhance um, your venue and things like that. And it wasn't until... Uh, I think COVID hit that that kind of flipped around a little bit. It's changed. Uh, so I was looking for a change and looking to get out of the city. And I knew I always wanted to own my own brands. And so uh, my business partner, Charles Ferry, who I've known for years, um, you know, we decided that we were going to make a go of this a while ago, like about 15 years ago, I think we're, or no, when we decided we're going to 2000, well, about 10 years ago, we decided that we were going to make a go of this. Um, and uh we, um, you know, we found this property and just knew that it was, it checked off all of our boxes. So it's an iconic hundred year old monastery that sits on the Hudson River. Uh, we got about 2,200 linear feet of shoreline. Um, our property line actually goes out into the Hudson River. So we will have a dock next year. Um, and the plan is we'll have a, you know, our distillery is operational right now. Uh, we just are completing our ballroom. Um, we have a couple more enhancements to make. And then, um, after that, I think we're um, uh, you know going to be in good shape. We'll have fifty. We'll have 20, 24 hotel rooms in the main property, and then when we're finished, we'll have probably ten or twelve glamping uh, sites that you can come in and 
you know, stay in the woods if you want. Um, it's a really amazing property. And I highly recommend everybody come check us out at the Hudson House NY.com. But I'm working on that. Um, I'm still doing my work with Responsible Hospitality Institute. We're planning um, our next summit, which will be next April in New York City. Um, what else am I doing? I am working with some friends, um, trying to get a, uh, a hotel restaurant up and running on Park Avenue and 30th Street for them. Um, and then that actually might lead into the development of a hospitality uh, investment fund that I'm working with on a couple of people. So I always move. I've just, you know, it's great being my own boss. And I just, you know, the, the problem is that when there's no money, I don't get paid. So, you know, that's just the only other problem. So you just got to keep. Yeah, moving. I, I think it outweighs. I mean, I've always uh, been my own boss, uh, you know, since I was 15. It does. So, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it, it, I it does. Uh, it has its benefits. Now, the benefits outweigh and I'm lucky the... Enough, and I'm lucky enough, Arlene, that I married somebody who's the exact opposite. She she needs that job. She needs that paycheck. And, you know, thank God, because when COVID hit and everything shut down, all of my income just stopped. It just came to a halt. And I and it took us a while before, uh, you know, any of us ICs, any of us 1099s could actually go out and get uh, uh, unemployment insurance. So... Thank God, for, thank God, my 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 my, my partner in life, uh, she um, yeah, she 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 held us together during those periods of time. So it's good to have that rock, so I can go out and do my crazy stuff, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a good partnership for you. Yeah. Yeah. Very so nice. here's my here's our last question, and then we'll wrap okay. it up. And okay. um, so if you could envision that you have the audience, you are able to sit in front of one person or one group that you feel could move this movement of reducing violence in the workplace, which in turn will reduce violence in society. Who would that be? Who would that person or group be that could move these efforts forward in your, in your opinion? Does everybody get this question, Arlene? Because this is the hard, the most difficult question so far. Did you just say <laughs> everybody yeah, okay, gets this question? Okay. And we get the we get I have received the full spectrum of a room full of 16-year-olds to Michelle Obama and Dr. Fauci. So we get we get the full spectrum of uh, of people that we feel we should the our guests think should hear this message. I would love to say. I would love to say that category from hashtag me too, that just really, you know, was that prime example of, of white privilege and men in power. I would love mm -hmm. to have them be the audience, but I feel like that would fall on deaf ears. And mm -hmm. I don't know that that's the right way to go. So I'm more inclined to say, I would much like to work with youth in that mm -hmm. goal and get them to understand harm reduction from an early age um, so that um, those types of events, if they ever encounter them, you know, theoretically, maybe there is some um, bystander interaction or intervention yeah. or things like that. Uh, I think it's really about the younger culture. And I'm really impressed with how Gen Zers have really been able to um, take all of this information that's being conveyed to them through their socials and their channels and things like that, and really focus on the things that they want to achieve and go out and achieve them. And I've been really impressed with some of the things that they've been able to do. So I would say the Gen Zers, the younger Gen Zers is who I would think that I'd really want to try to get in front of and say, guys, look, you know, uh, and especially the males, um, this is, this is really, you know, you're going to go out, you're going to experience new things. You're going to be out of your house for the first time treat women and, and treat everybody the way you'd want to be treated. Right. I mean, if you feel like it's appropriate for somebody to grab, grab you, then I'm going to get up and grab you right now. And if you feel like that's appropriate, well, then you're the wrong person to be here because I can't reach you. But if right. you feel like you don't know what to do in those types of situations, well, then maybe we can kind of sit down and have a conversation about coming up with those solutions that you can you can have for yourself. Right. right. Great. Makes sense? Thank you. Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> and I think what continues to come out in this interview, Paul, is the word conversation. You're constantly wanting to have conversations. You're constantly wanting to collaborate. You're constantly wanting to hear uh, different viewpoints. And I think that has played uh, to your success, uh, one of the contributors to your success. So yeah, thank you so very much 
for joining us today. Um, I, I can't wait till our sleeves are rolled up and we're working at this for two and a half days at the summit. I'm super yeah. excited and motivated and inspired by the group of speakers that we're bringing in. And so I'll tell our audience um, thank you so much for listening and watching another, another episode of Disrupting the Dominoes. That's Disrupting the Dominoes of Violence. So have a wonderful day. If you enjoyed what you watched and what you heard, please subscribe. <laughs>